Okay. Okay, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 APRU Sustainable Cities and Landscapes webinar series. Today's session is about vulnerable communities and climate justice, hosted by Professor Ching-Wen Cheng from the Arizona State University. Uh, this is our eighth webinar session in our series. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. My name is Ye Gang Ko, Program Director of the APRU Sustainable Cities and Landscapes Hub uh, and the Associate Professor of Landscape Architecture at the University of Oregon. Before we get started today's webinar, I just want to mention a couple of things about APRU and our Sustainable Cities and Landscapes program. So for those of you who are not familiar with APRU, first of all, APRU is uh, the Association of Pacific Rim Universities. It's a network of 60 leading universities linking the Americas, Asia, Australasia. We leverage collective education and research capabilities of our members into the international public policy process. The Sustainable Cities and Landscapes program is one of the APRU's primary research programs. We collaborate on effective solutions to challenges of the 21st century. And SCL Hub has 19 core members across the Pacific Rim, and the hub is housed at the University of Oregon. The SCL Hub successfully held four annual conferences in Poland in 2017, in Hong Kong in 2018, Sydney in 2019, and 2020 in virtually in Oakland. So each conference offered various activities that students and uh, practitioners and scholars can participate in, such as research working groups, a design field school, and a student design competition, and a research symposium for PhD students. So this year, instead of our annual conference, we offer a live webinar series organized by our working groups, celebrating our fifth year. Uh, all the previous webinar recordings are available on the APRU SCL webinar series webpage. So please feel free to visit our webpage to see all the previous webinar recordings. Uh, after today, there, are, uh, there is one more thematic webinar on the inter, intertidal zone in December. And then we are hosting two more webinar series in early next year. So our next webinar will be hosted by Professor Natalie H. Ber H. Berry uh, from the University of Hong Kong at 9 a.m. on December 10th in Hong Kong time, and which will be 5 p.m. on December 9th in Pacific time. So the, this webinar uh, engages with the dynamics of intertidal zones and their human and non-human inhabitants in two distinct regions 
along the Pacific Rim. So first, Hong Kong at the edge of the Pearl River Delta and the Gulf of uh, Tribuga, an area in the Pacific coast of Colombia. The, those two presentations will address um, issues related to social cultural pr practices of communities living in these landscapes and review ecological engineering strategies for regenerating hard coastal edges and discuss the pedagogical method that are cultivating rich design education through engagement with, within the intertidal zone. Lastly, um, exciting news is the forthcoming Rawich Handbook of Sustainable Cities and Landscapes in the Pacific Rim. They will introduce um, the handbook to explore the new ways of understanding sustainable cities and landscapes. And the handbook include over 60 case studies across the Pacific Rim, 64 chapters contributed by 116 authors from th three, 38 institutions across the Pacific Rim, include, including this, um, the vulnerable communities and climate justice section contributed by today's speakers. I hope you continue to join us and explore how cities and regions across the Pacific Rim address climate change and social equity to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Please contact us through email, visit our website, Facebook, or Instagram if you are interested in participating in our activity. Thank you and enjoy today's webinar. Uh, now I'd like to uh, pass on to today's webinar host, Professor Chi Chang. Thank Thank you very much, Professor Ikanga. Let me share my... Again, thank you for the introduction. And that's uh, actually very helpful. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, as uh, Dr. Tao mentioned, Today's session, we invited uh, the authors from the uh, upcoming handbook and joining us, including well, myself, I'm Jingwen Chen. Um, I'm the program head and the associate professor of landscape architecture and in um, Arizona State University. And then we have J John Sarah Alec from University of the Philippines, uh, Indrajit Pao, from Asian Institute of Technology uh, in Thailand, and uh, George Yao from National Chenggong University in Taiwan. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Adam Babet from University of Oslo cannot join us today uh, due to COVID and uh, some live events happened. And uh, he sent his regrets today. Uh, finally, uh, last but not least is Heijun Chai uh, from Taijie uh, Research Foundation in South Korea. So as uh, Dr. Kang mentioned, uh, we are part of the vulnerable, resilient, and climate justice communities working group, and we try to address those three goals in the sustainable development uh, goals. Uh, how we can build a more resilient infrastructure and make innovations to build a, um, more resilient cities and communities and how we can address climate actions and especially uh, addressing uh, inequity. So as today's world has becoming more complex and diverse and we have a pressing issues on multiple stressors in the world, and including the ones that um, like pandemic, climate change, environmental degradations, social injustice, etc. So in this complex you know, social, ecological, technological systems, how we can think about the interrelationship between environment, equity, and economy to be truly sustainable, in particularly when we are under the social drivers of systemic injustice and the ecological driver from climate change. So the causes of how we can look at the intersection between 
vulnerability, resilience, and how we can address climate justice in our communities is the core of uh, research questions that we are trying to investigate. And as uh, mentioned that our work presented today is a preview of the upcoming book. And we will uh, introduce briefly for each chapter and then we will have a final uh, panel discussions at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to start with the first chapter video. Hi, I'm Jin Wan Chen, Associate Professor and Program Head of landscape architecture, urban design, environmental design at the design school at Arizona State University. Along with my co-authors, Stephanie Prinsdell from UCLA, Louis McKenzie from AUNSW Sydney, we are presenting a book chapter, Understanding Vulnerability in Cities, Perspectives from APRU Vulnerable Communities Working Group Participants. As the title suggested, this work is derived from the APRU Sustainable Cities and Landscapes conferences, in particular in 2018 and 2019. And the participants include a range of different backgrounds from researchers, students, practitioners in academic industry. And we started in 2018 with our group uh, the vulnerable communities group and discussed a range of issues what construct vulnerability and what are the gaps in the literature and at the end of the conference we decided to have a more engaged and in-depth interview with each other and get some more insights yes. even from our are you showing story. the slide so the interview oh, yes. started hold on in yeah i can yeah we cannot see the slide we only hear the voice. Okay, okay, sorry. How does vulnerability look? Sorry, I am sh I am sh sharing the... Hi, Oops. I'm George Yao, a professor. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, sorry, I practiced earlier. I should be sharing this um, video. I could see uh, the presentation. Oh, really? Then maybe that yeah. was. Did you see, now did I'm you seeing see it. it. Now I see. Okay. Did you see this? Yeah, I can see. Okay. Oh, sorry. okay. I'm sorry. I I didn't see it. I'm nice. I'm I'm now seeing it. Yeah. Sorry. So the interview <laughs> started in 2019 and 2020, and we started by asking ourselves, how does vulnerability look? And this is a picture uh, from a school in Thailand, and it was constructed on a floating structure, and uh, it's, it's frequently flooded uh, in, in the uh, region. However, it is functional even when it's flooded. So we question ourselves, is this, place looks vulnerable or if it is resilient. And to look into uh, the next questions, we want to do a um, semi-structural interview with each other. And we have 11 participants and representing the government, the community, industry, academic in various level, uh, region in Australia, Hawaii, Hong Kong, India, Philippines, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, and the US. And we have a range of background and interests uh, from planning, design, engineering, architecture, landscape architecture, and climate justice and climate change science. And we question ourselves, how do we conceptualize mobility in mega cities and how those various approaches to reducing vulnerabilities in megacities. 
And now uh, those approaches generalize generalizable and how does the climate change play a role in creating uh, vulnerable DMs, making different risks. And the results, we have seven concepts that I will introduce uh, respectively. The first one, we uh, want to understand how we conceptualize vulnerability. And we acknowledge that the vulnerability in megacities is a nested, tiered, and interacting system. Starting by understanding the root causes of vulnerability, we understand there are history and the various contexts in different communities that can cause and construct the social, um, socially constructed risks and vulnerability. For example, in Phoenix, there are environmental justice issues where Hispanic origin and low income families are uh, living right next to hazardous waste sites and industrial land uses. And in, in Philippines, there are millions of informal settlers living in the dangerous uh, flooding zones and uh, facing the typhoons and other hazards. And in Sydney, Australia, the health impacts are also improportionately affecting vulnerable communities, especially in some parts of Western uh, Sydney that are more uh, sprawly patterns of urban development, a lack of public infrastructure and transportation to help to mitigate those impacts. And those are also a lot of more migrant communities living there. So the point uh, we were making is, it's not a how you live in cities under those uh, different conditions. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not how the literature defining, but it's, it's how the city was constructed. And there are also uh, personal experience and its perspective perceptions can affect how vulnerability is constructed. And some people experience vulnerability maybe in their whole life. Um, for example, in Bangladesh, they may not realize they are under the risk and they may not know the best way to uh, empower, to act and to, uh, to counter the vulnerability. So the impacts of limited choice uh, as how they construct vulnerability can be largely overlooked. And next we found a, 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 an interesting point from the younger participants. And they particularly talk about gener generational vulnerabilities, especially in Hong Kong, for example, the young people cannot afford to buy house, affordable housings and they cannot uh, be independent as their parents do. And sometimes they were not fully understood by uh, parents and older generations as they were being uh, thought and per perceived as not working hard enough. So there are generational gap in understanding the vulnerability. And then there is, when we talk about vulnerability and climate change together, we have to think about uh, the social justice and inequity perspective. As one participant noted, uh, sometimes I found that the whole idea of climate vulnerability in megacities and artifacts, uh, a way to deflect attention from the very basic kinds of social justice, environmental questions that have existed. Um, so it, we found uh, sometimes we talk about climate science as if those social injustice can suddenly disappear. Uh, but in fact, it is, we have to face how we can uproot those injustice and how can we address those climate impacts if people don't even have the sufficient basic needs. Therefore, uh, in some cases, we may hear that 
uh, in Hawaii, for example, the indigenous communities were left out in the conversations for climate change action plans and um, climate adaptation efforts. So there is a lot of social sy systemic issues that we need to address while we are talking about climate change and the vulnerability. And the next question would be, how can we reconcile the differences uh, between local and the global issues? Because the vulnerability is very diverse and uh, it, there's a disparities within cities, uh, even uh, within the same uh, communities. And it, it's operating at a micro scale, individual level, or at the neighborhood and community level. So there is a variety of scale that we are talking about. It's definitely not one size fits all, and we need to be locally specific. So how can we think about uh, a global urban public? And this is also about cons constituency because all the politics are local. So how can we consider a global uh, impacts and why we can address from local and community scale. And the reducing the vulnerability in mega city will require organizing the units at sufficient scales. And so how can we operate within a large framework to study local scale? So there is a gap in the literature and how we can address uh, those social issues. And there is also a gap in the practice and theory and and how we can make sure those framework can be implemented. The next about plasticity and the transferability. So that we have to think about solutions that are place specific. Um, even the same hazards can have different uh, impacts uh, from different countries and different communities. <laughs> and how we uh, structure organization can, uh, how can we succeed without uh, many resources? And that's particularly in the global south. And there's also a question about you know, how we can use uh, education and uh, increase awareness so that people can be advocates for themselves first. And how can we make the transferability uh, possible between the global north and global south? Uh, the, the researchers were pointing out that there are differences between the global north and south, and we forget uh, the climates are different and the resources are distributed differently. <clears throat> and the solutions we found, you know, in the global north may not be applicable and available in the global south. And we also recognize while Global South has much uh, more connected social capital and how can we, uh, how can we overcome the vulnerability in those communities? And even this in, this, in terms of social capital, it might be easier you know, just to make uh, the resources available uh, next door uh, in your community. And this is in particular in the global north, we are lacking of uh, that connections between our communities. And in the global north, we may also have the built uh, vulnerability, you know, such as those infrastructure that is not sustainable and it has already making our physical environment more vulnerable and harder to change. <clears throat> Although in the global south, uh, living, uh, we have, they are facing different vulnerability, but they also have more experience and they keep the knowledge of living with nature. So their vulnerability can, are understood and constructed differently. The last is about social memory and indigenous knowledge. So there is a collective social memory learn, 
memory learn and learnings from the past experiences that can enable our society to adapt for futures. So how can we shift the paradigm of fluvial flooding as a hazard in, for example, in Bangkok, and then to change the people's framing about, you know, no flooding is a good, good condition uh, because as the climate change uh, make the more uh, uncertainty, uh, how to live with nature, how to be resilient is becoming a new paradigm of how we can treat our environment as part of the nature. And in Fiji, for example, the local people have developed perspectives and to celebrate the floods instead of to be away from floods. And then there's a traditional ways of living uh, that extreme heat can be reinterpreted in a contemporary way of building and in our field environment. And this photo in uh, Spain kind of showing that they use the temporary uh, art uh, uh, installations to provide shade and this idea this is experience from indig indigenous and local knowledge and experience and apply to today's society so in discussion we have a few uh, points the first is how we can generate more empathy and humanity in our education and practices uh, so, for example, there's a polarization, misunderstanding between generations, and how can we cultivate the empathy uh, towards various populations and generations? And then how can we generalize a concept? Uh, and there is a danger of trying to use, you know, one size fits all concepts and to generalize the, the ideas and transfer the technologies from one place to the other so we have to be cautious and to we should be engaging on deeper and more structural issues uh, than to understand the community and we have to think about how we can reimagine a more transformative uh, transformative culture uh, urban futures and so for example the idea of afrofuturism creates uh, a, a good transformative idea to let let us to think an alternative way and to create our cities and how we can address the past decolonization, how can we get these possessions and marginalized group, dehumanization in the past, and to move forward to be a more transformative and equitable futures. So in conclusion, um, our research found out that the inequity is the common drive that our group has pointed out. And if across the different countries, different cultures, and over time and the generations. And so in the next step is how we can think about climate actions now is to build a better future for our cities and communities, and that should reduce the vulnerability and enhance adaptive capacity and to mitigate inequity for all communities. And we want to acknowledge uh, all participants from the conferences and then uh, those co-chairs in those conferences. And this is our contact information. Thank you. Magandang araw sa ating lahat. On behalf of our team from the University of the Philippines, allow me to share with you our contribution to the book with our study entitled Flood Vulnerability Assessment in Marinduque, Philippines using Fuzzy Logic and Principal Component Analysis. The team is led by Dr. Arnold Salvacion together with 
uh, Dr. Devanadera, Professor Paro, Professor Lecciones, and yours truly. Marinduque is an island province located 200 kilometers away south of Manila in the heart of the Philippine archipelago. Farming and fishing are the primary sources of livelihood in the island where there is a high prevalence of malnutrition and poverty in the province. Like any other local government unit in the country, the province of Marinduque uses their own capabilities and the resources to assess their own disaster risk with the assistance of the national government, of course. As such, much needed technical assistance can be provided for these local government units to make their climate and disaster risk assessment more reflective of their local context. And that was what our study hoped to contribute. We applied the methodologies that I will share with you in the context of flooding hazard as a start for this undertaking. We tried to answer this question, how do we quantify geo-environmental and social vulnerability to flood? For flooding, higher vulnerability is expected for people living in flood zone compared to those living in non-flood zone areas, which provides information for understanding the community's vulnerability as influenced by their location. So that's number one. However, the geo-environmental vulnerability <clears throat> cannot explain losses from disaster concerning social factors. Hence, there is a need to measure social vulnerability as well. According to literature, social vulnerability measures the presence or lack of capa the presence or lack of capability of individuals, communities, or groups to cope and adapt to any external set stress placed on their well-being and livelihoods. According to previous studies, a way to quantify geo-environmental vulnerability is fuzzy logic, while a principal component analysis can be used to measure socioeconomic factors affecting social vulnerability. Let's begin with comparing fuzzy logic and principal component analysis and how we applied it in our research. Let's begin with fuzzy logic. A short definition of fuzzy logic is a, is a soft computing methodology that tolerates vagueness and imprecision, which can be an attribute of many data available about vulnerability. In the case of geo-environmental <clears throat> vulnerability, fuzzy logic involves the assignment of membership from zero to one that provides different degrees of vulnerability rather than the crude binary, yes, this community is vulnerable or no, this community is not uh, vulnerable to flood, through flooding, for example. In fact, the fuzzy logic has already been applied in related researches about disaster risk management, such as the one conducted by Hong et al. in 2018. Also, fuzzy logic with GIS allows evaluation of complex problems in practical ways. Our study used the two, uh, used two fuzzy membership function, as shown in, the, in this equation, which depends on how the factors affect flood vulnerability. As for <clears throat> the social vulnerability, constructing indices are commonly done using either variable reduction or variable addition approach. Uh, basically, this approach looks for the most influential components uh, from the socioeconomic and demographic profile, for example, using PCA or principal component analysis, where highly correlated variables are grouped. These variables are then normalized, then added using either by the use of the weight or weighting approach. So what you see here are the fuzzy parameters and membership functions based on various literature that we therefore used in our study regarding flooding vulnerability. Factors that increase flooding vulnerability such as annual rainfall use the L function as shown in equation 1 from the previous slide while R function, equation 2, for factors that decrease flooding vulnerability such as elevation. Moving forward, different socioeconomic and demographic data can be used for the development of the village level social vulnerability index. This included taking in the percentage and proportion of the following indicators as shown in the slide, such as getting the proportion of malnourished children, proportion of households without access to safe water, households experiencing food shortage, among others. So geared with this knowledge about ways to measure vulnerability, we proceed with the identification of data sources in conducting our study. <clears throat> 
we made use of available database for evaluation, uh, elevation, sorry, elevation and topographic features, while we used available community-based monitoring system containing the socioeconomic data at the village level. For context, the province of Marinduque is consists of 218 villages divided into six municipalities. Through the R programming language, the data were processed to identify villages most vulnerable to flooding. This is in the hope that the local decision and policymakers will be able to develop adaptation measures targeting the most vulnerable villages in terms of flooding hazard. So the results indicate that large proportion of areas with high vulnerability to flooding were observed mostly in the coastal areas um, <clears throat> as expected. In, this is shown in figure 2. In terms of land area, the municipality of Boac has the highest coverage this area with fl high flooding hazard, while Mogpog tops in terms of proportion of its jurisdiction under high vulnerability to flooding. Uh, figure 3 shows the spatial pattern of the social vulnerability index in Marinduque. So the villages of Talawan in Torrijos, this one, the red area, has the highest social vulnerability primarily due to lack of access to safe water and high poverty rate. Meanwhile, the nearby village, uh, the low social vulnerability score of Malbog in Buenavista, this area, is due to lower rate and proportion of child malnutrition, households living in makeshift uh, housing, illiteracy rate, and almost 100% of the households in this area, in Malbog, Buenavista, has access to safe water. This bivariate map combines the results of the two measurements, um, vulnerability measurements. Again, there are 17 villages in the province that have high social vulnerability index and flooding hazard. The municipality of Gasan has the most number of villages that have high social vulnerability index and flooding hazards, while the municipality of Torrijos has the list. Again, high social vulnerability index and flooding hazards in these villages can be attributed to can be attributed to high poverty rate, high proportion of female population, and their location and topography, which is coastal and flat. So to end. There are several takeaways from this study. The first one is the influence of location, which indicates higher geo-environmental vulnerability can be observed in low-lying areas of the province. Next is social vulnerability varies across the province while the social uh, uh, because of different socioeconomic and demographic factors. Those are the influences. The third is this study can be a baseline information for the local government unit of Marinduque to further explore social resilience of each village in the province to flooding. Especially, uh, finally, so finally, the approach presented in this study can be explored for adaptation in other natural hazards in the province or in other areas of the country. On Hello. Jen, can I, can I start? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Inzajit. I'm from uh, Disaster Preparedness Mitigation and Management uh, uh, Unit of Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand. I'm Associate Professor and uh, Chair of the Center. Um, our chapter actually talks about integrated water management model for coastal uh, resilient city planning for hydrometeorological hazards. Uh, we have uh, done a case study for Chennai uh, city 
um, that's in the coastal part, eastern part of uh, Indian coast. In this paper, uh, let's, let me brief about the study area where we have done uh, this particular uh, study. So Chennai is located in the eastern part of uh, Indian coast. It's about uh, 5,000 kilometer long coast of in, uh, one of the part of uh, Indian coast. The city is located in the eastern part of India and uh, primarily faced by the fluvial flood occurred very frequently in the city. This city has also become very important in uh, since 2000 uh, to become uh, IT hub. And city cooperation also uh, area increased four times from its original size in 2011. So you can understand like how much pressure is putting into the system. Uh, and the population size also increased from 5.8 million uh, in 2001 to 8.9 million in uh, 2011. So now it's more than sort of 13 million at this point. Uh, open area decreased drastically and there are uh, a lot of other uh, land use also changed. Um, rapid urbanization, as we know, like is one of the major pressure which is putting uh, the entire community towards a more vulnerable system or situation. And the second part is also the flood management process. Like what are the flood management process that uh, the state level and the municipal level they're following. So we have tried to look into the, uh, the various system at uh, uh, different jurisdictions. So there we found like uh, primarily we tried to elaborate like uh, stormwater drainage system, how it functions and how the network is also in place. Second, the, the complementary knowledge uh, coalition uh, built up around the city administration how it is linking up. In the end, I'll show you one of the network or the framework we have tried to develop, uh, putting all these different type of um, uh, knowledge um, uh, process. So these are the impact actually, our primary study uh, um, uh, mostly covered about the 2015, there was a heavy rain and that is uh, created a huge flood, flooding uh, in the city. And the flooding is very much uh, almost very frequent every year at least twice so but this particular uh, situation actually put the city almost in halt and uh, there's a lot, large number of deaths as well if you can see the statistics of that particular uh, disaster of 2015 heavy rain uh, a huge number of public infrastructure was also damaged 95 percent of the people survive, surveyed has not been uh, received warning uh, of this particular uh, event uh, total loss of the household range from 75,000 uh, Indian rupees. And then the system was not functional. All the hotels was closed for two weeks and the entire city business was also stopped. So you, as I mentioned, like in 2000, 2000 onward, the city is becoming one of the major hub for the IT um, profession. So city become more important and, but two weeks, the city was closed. So you can understand the huge financial loss uh, due to the closure of the city. Um, there are a few uh, points to be mentioned here. 2015 incident shows that uh, the city is grossly unprepared. There was no early warning system in place, although the early warning system was there, but it was not disseminated uh, to, the, to the public uh, properly. <laughs> And the next point is the no system for gradual release of the water. So the drainage system was not, uh, not constructed, keeping in mind like huge uh, amount of precipitation in the city level. So this is the sort of overall vulnerability structure maybe uh, in the city coastal area of India. If you see like there are about 75,000, uh, 7,500 kilometers. Um, sort of length of the coastline and uh, out of that, this particular area actually where we are covering right now. Um, this particular coastal areas are very much important in terms of various aspects. One is the productivity of the ecosystem, um, a high uh, concern, uh, concentration of the population. Some of the part are very, very uh, population, um, densely populated and uh, industrial friendly waste disposal part is also not much uh, talked about uh, tourism is also one of the important component here so these are the few uh, things actually which make the city more vulnerable in, in various aspects 
uh, <clears throat> so we have tried to look into uh, the entire course for, from other study actually. So we just, I, I'd like to show you uh, to contextualize this particular study as well. So Indian coast is subject to the extreme weather event, as you know, like the climate change is also uh, very frequently impacting uh, various countries, mostly on the coastal lines. So this part actually, if you see the uh, high erosion and uh, is, is plotted in the, during, uh, on, through the coastline. So we can also see uh, there are a moderate and low level of erosion is also one of the component, uh, which is also uh, putting pressure on the coastal part of this particular zone. Uh, so based on the potential climate change impact on the natural disaster scenario that includes long period of drought, heavy rainfall uh, leading to the flash flood. This is also one uh, concept, uh, 2015 event actually we considered as a flash flood in the city level. So if you talk about the human activity, unplanned infrastructure development, increase in the population density, ocean acidification and sand mining. These are the few areas like last two points are actually creating pressure on the, on the erosion part on the coastal side. Um, unplanned infrastructure we'll discuss a little bit more in the next, in the consecutive slides. Uh, we have a couple of uh, risk governance mechanism in place. If you look into the structure, uh, like this is a three tier structure that the government of India is following. One part is about the national disaster management authority at the national level. Next, the provincial level is uh, authority is called, called about uh, state state disaster management authority. And the next is a district disaster management authority. Apart from that, there is also very strong uh, municipal governance, which uh, also having uh, um, sort of autonomy to decide and they have their own disaster management plan at the city level, apart from the district level disaster management authority. So we have few examples in the past uh, in the coastline, uh, like Risa uh, super cyclone, and there are at least seven cyclones happened in uh, before 2015, uh, major cyclone, which has impacted the coastal cities in the eastern coast primarily. Uh, these eight points actually we have came up with, and these eight points, like the global disaster risk reduction framework, if you talk about the initiatives in Indian context, uh, the eight points, which is talks about the implication of the disaster incidents on department level scheme. So uh, most, of, most of the departments having their SOP in place, for uh, various events. Second, the reason for developing DRR into department plans and benefits uh, emanating from this uh, not lucidly communicated. So the point is there are plans, but the plan is not very much communicated to the, to the, to the officials who are supposed to be implement that particular plan. So this is one of the communication sort of uh, uh, breakage or gap, what you have realized is uh, there is ambiguity uh, about the cost escalation as uh, who would share the additional burden. So the, uh, the, uh, the, the point is that the, the plan is not very much dynamic in, in, in nature. The point number four is adaptation of the DR initiatives are suggested without consultation, awareness, and capacity building. So the initiatives we are proposing through the, through the plan that is mostly on the, uh, on the, in, in the book. So it's not uh, constructed keeping in mind so mostly if you to talk about this is a top down approach uh, partially the bottom up approach uh, should consider the consultation with the stakeholders that part is also a gap we have realized fifth one change uh, threatens to modify established pattern of the working relationship between the people so that the communication between the people and the authorities also a gap we have uh, found out uh, not enough time to adjust the changed uh, ground reality. So departments are not given enough time to, to adjust uh, the revised uh, plan or something like this. Uh, benefits and rewards are not, not in place. Uh, if someone is changing or someone is apply, applying the DRR process, so that group of people are not uh, sort of rewarded as per the sort of uh, present scenario. <clears throat> Efforts of NDMA, the National Disaster Management Authority and the State Disaster Management Authority, uh, awareness capacity building uh, for the department officials are not adequate. Maybe once in a year or um, once in a two years time is uh, there are some sort of training program or some capacity building drive, but it should be very much regular, at least in the vulnerable locations. So that part is also a gap. Uh, if we look into the mega urbanization context here, so these uh, three blocks is, is talking about the urbanization challenges. 
uh, what really the challenge the local local level governments are facing. So first one, the concentration of the economic and political power. So with the population density, political powers and the economic things also coming in. And with that, uh, many of the um, decisions are driven by uh, not through the uh, vulnerable process. So it may be through the political powers. Uh, high population density is also one of the challenges uh, in that particular um, coastal cities. Unprecedented growth. Uh, in various aspects. So if you look into the right side here, the increase uh, of social polarization, marginalized population uh, is increasing, uh, and uh, that is leading to vulnerability to few things like economic, social, political insecurity, exploitation of the laborers, laborers and the environmental pollution. All these things are happening due to various pressure in terms of the population densities and also uh, political uh, sort of unwillingness, you can say. Uh, these are the broad aspect of the flood impact here. So flood, uh, maybe we can move on to the next slide. So finally, we uh, have checked the integrated flood management uh, is one of the um, process other global, um, other, other cities are also following, following in the uh, various context. So that also we checked and how it is functional in the this particular case study. Uh, so in, while talking about the IFM, integrated flood management, so multiple knowledge type, community-based approach and experience-based approach, this like, or the evidence-based approach, this a few things we have came up with. And as I mentioned, like community-based approach uh, or the bottom-up approach is a little bit of gap uh, in, the, in the system at present. So this is the overall uh, sort of context we came up uh, in the paper. Uh, we uh, have more detail in the paper. So in terms of the flood management, uh, the relation between the stormwater at uh, the micro level and uh, macro level. And uh, <clears throat> so this, we'll talk about uh, various components and its interrelation. Uh, for the integrated flood management and their incorporation into the, uh, the theoretical configuration, how it is there. We have tried to look into the theoretical perspective, how many people are using, how many cities are using, and how uh, what are the context uh, is relevant for that particular uh, cases of IFM. Uh, this is the final uh, production, um, like the knowledge construction process and potential in interconnection in, in the Chennai city. City context, we have tried to contextualize. Um, so how the city is functioning and uh, what are the uh, process maybe need to be revised. So here, um, the network and um, early warning network and uh, academic activities to be promoted, then that is, uh, and the second part is land use planning uh, by the municipal uh, development authority and the storm water um, drainage system network, uh, primary government network. So this is the, and these are the also, the, um, the departments or the schemes which are which is actually uh, promoting that uh, stormwater drainage system network. So the, uh, maybe there's not enough time to describe each of the boxes here. So we have described in detail in our paper of this particular uh, construction of the knowledge. And finally, in short, we should follow the SMART process. SMART uh, stands for the specific measurable, attainable, and uh, assignable, and realistic and time related, uh, like smart city concept of uh, European Commission. That uh, report came in 2013. So we have tried to modify. So this is the simplification of the smart city governance approach from the EU, uh, where we have taken almost all the different type of capitals, actually, biodiversity, natural hazards, uh, climate applications. So this is my last slide on the discussion. So um, uh, after uh, going through this particular study, we came up with the process like uh, knowledge construction process and potential interconnection in Chennai. Uh, flood management are purely based on the city's practical flood incident. So we should take lesson from the previous floods of Chennai, that uh, highly populated city. Uh, primary method of dealing with the fluvial and uh, urban flood is uh, through the SWD or stormwater at end system, um, not through the indicated flood management. So the SWD system should be uh, enhanced or improved. Monitoring and maintenance of homeowners of that particular city is also uh, limited. Uh, like rainwater harvesting system can be installed. 
And uh, finally, the critical key factors, proper process of timeline, actual interconnections and potential interconnections and affordable negotiations. These four components actually are missing. Like we may uh, implement something, but it may not be feasible many times. So with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you. Hi. I'm George Yao, a professor in Taiwan, and I'm presenting this Taiwanese experience in housing flood resiliency today. Taiwan is often visited by typhoon several times a year because we are on the typhoon tracks in the western Pacific coast. Besides typhoon, we also have large earthquake as a major natural disaster source. The table on the right shows the largest earthquake in 1999 in a century and also the largest typhoon in half a century in 2009, Typhoon Morocco. It caused double A flood, is the second largest disaster in the past three decades. Uh, this picture shows the largest three day accumulated rainfall of the double A flood is near 1500 millimeter that ties the world record and <clears throat> a lot of damage were done to the southwestern Taiwan. However, nine years after that, a tropical cyclone again poured down near a thousand millimeter for three days. Again, inundated southwestern Taiwan, as you can see with the red areas. Uh, the government did some work to increase the housing resiliency against flooding after the double A floods. However, compounded by the climate change effect, many areas was inundated again in 2018. Uh, installation of floodgates seems to be the only solution provided by the government. And we noticed that this is not enough. Uh, overall, there are many problems with floodgates only, uh, such as there's no quality assurance lab, and there's no clear specification of gate height needed for individual housings, and there's no consideration of emergency egress, and there's lack of solution for indoor drainage and backflow of sewage. Uh, overall, there is no comprehensive design approaches for people to install water gates. So, uh, as a result, we decided to conduct some field survey to understand what the people feel about it and what can be done to improve the building resiliency against floodings. So, we visited several places. And this is one of the village we visit. It's a village called Jia Dong Village. It's located in southwestern Taiwan, where ground subsidence is very serious and frequent flooding is common for them. And this is the pictures of that village two weeks after the Typhoon Morocco attack, which caused the double A floods. And one of the <coughs> residents, uh, Mr. Lin, he was a teacher before he retired, has a very interesting experience in his building during the AA floods. The owner elevated his house for three meters before the flood and has, it, has its own external stairways to the second floor, well prepared for floodings to come. However, during the double A floods, the water level is 1.5 meter above ground. The owner uh, found that without water and electricity, he cannot sleep in the house. So he has to sleep in shelter at night and return home during the daytime, trying to do some cleanup work. However, he had noticed that since there is no water for cleanup work, 
you can do nothing. You can do only little until the electricity is recovered on the third day after the double A floods. So you don't just raise the building and took care of everything. You need to have multiple functions well prepared for uh, a major flood. However, to elevate a building uh, may be easy for some countries. In Taiwan, as I pointed out earlier, that we have earthquakes. So to elevate a building may be good for flooding resilience, but it may bring up a soft story effect in earthquakes. Therefore, in Taiwan, we need to have more consideration for uh, raising a building at the ground floor. And there's a very interesting case. Uh, it's happened in 2018 flooding. And a whole village was inundated. That's in central Taiwan, except one. And one house was not affected at all. The owner explained his engineering geniuses to us, and we think it may be a good idea to share with everyone. And for his case, he, re he retrofitted his campus wall to make sure they are watertight at the beginning. Store in a driveway so that the floodgate can be erected when flooding earning flooding warning was given. So we asked him what else he has done to prevent backflow from the outside drainage systems, and that happens quite often for many residential buildings. Well, he explained that. Uh, the water inside the campus wall were well guided and flow out of the campus wall at only one particular spot. That's where the spot is, the, the blue arrows. And on that spot, when there's a flooding, you will put up a long pipe at the exit hole to prevent water from backflow from outside. In the meantime, you will use supplemental pump to pump water in, inside the campus over the walls. And that helped him to stay dry for three days. Here is his theory. He raised a pipe here at the exit on, on, in the gutter to the outside. And by using the communicating vessel theory, the water in the pipe will rise to the same elevation as the outside, so that the water pressures from the backflow is released. And then you will put up the pump to pump the water over the fence. We also participated in a village self-help operation near my university. The village is called E Xinli. Uh, the village is frequent by flooding and we held the village president to monitor to live along seniors uh, to prepare an early warning system for flooding. Before this early warning system were installed, the president is always troubled by how to make sure the monitored senior's house is flooded or not. As you can see on the picture, uh, village president's office it's kind of far away from those two seniors, point one and point two uh, locations. So <clears throat> we install water meter detector at the front doors doorsteps of those seniors. When water rises to trigger the detector, the signal will be sent to a security company's control center that operates 24 hours. The control center will activate on-site camera to make sure it is flooding and notify the village president via cell phone app. So as you can see in the pictures, uh, on the right hand, right, right hand side on top is that 24-hour monitoring and notification contact center. 
This is where the water meter is connected to the internet wire on the left, and the right picture shows the camera across the street on the right. The village president is able to see the pictures from the camera uh, on his own smartphone. So that's the brief story of my presentation. And I think there are many things that we can improve on flooding resiliencies in Taiwan. I'm happy to share my experience with you people. Thank you very much. That concludes my talk. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this webinar. Today, I will talk about future cities, which will be developed in developing country. Rather than the futures of a current city in developed country, I will focus on the vulnerability of the urbanization process itself, centered on the mega city of mass production and mass consumption, which is the main cause of climate change and rapid environmental destruction, and rethink the meaning of cities in the transitional period of civilization from the age of industrialization to the age of knowledge and information. At the end, I will conclude by providing three strategies uh, for building better future city. So, mega city have become centered on the phenomena of globalization and information exchange in China alone. There are six mega city. Guangzhou has population of 40. 6 million, Shanghai has 33 million, Beijing has 20 million. By 2030, it is estimated that around 630 million people will live in close to 40 megacities around the world. Many megacities function as both state capital and financial center. This intense concentration of production has and people leads to high resource consumption and concomitant environmental degradation such as air and water pollution and the generation of a large amount of solid waste. What are challenges of mega city and small city then? I will discuss on the vulnerability of global urbanization. This chart represents the specific impact of global urbanization depending on the size and the gap between upper income nation and developing nation. In many established cities, the operational and maintenance cost of infrastructure is one of the difficult problems because the infrastructure was installed during the early phase of industrialization and is coming to the end of its operational life cycle. For example, New York City, where it was found that 37 of the survey signals have exceeded their useful life. 63% of cargo facilities at JFK Airport are non viable. 24% of the water that enters distribution may never reach the customer due to leaks. And 11% of bridges are structurally deficient. It is estimated that $47 billion is needed over the next four to five years simply to bring the city's aging infrastructure to a state of good repair. Environmental pollution is probably the most significant problem facing our city as a result of the rapid industrialization caused by the mega city centered urbanization process. Some of the major air pollutants in cities are sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, carbon dioxide, and particulate. These pollutants have effect on local, regional, and global scale. On the other hand, more small and medium-sized cities in the developing world are collapsing because of their inferior quality of life and lack of competitiveness compared with mega city. With the nation limited resource over invested in mega city, small and medium-sized city could not attract competent talent. Due to the shortage of capable manpower and the leadership of a major industry, there are not many small and medium-sized cities that can be sustained in the long term. This problem is accelerating further since globalization has opened up cities of all sizes to global competition. 
both mega city and small and medium sized city remain trapped in this cycle of unsustainable urbanization, which continue in many developing countries. So, before addressing each challenge, we need to think about the fundamental question. We should ask not only how to overcome immediate threat, but also what kind of world we and the next generation want to inhabit because cities have a vital role in shaping the human spirit for good or for ill. How should we imagine the future of humanity? What kind of values should a city seek to embody in the age of knowledge and information? What role should they play in making humanity and the world more sustainable? We need the compelling vision and system for future city that will move us beyond the limitation of purely instrumental or utilitarian consideration, now more than ever before. For sure, smart cities often mentioned when referring to future city must necessarily go beyond this technology, which is the tool or method to achieve the desired goal and should be intentionality shaped by the human spirit for good. For the reason, strategic vision which can be new culture is urgently needed. The essence of strategic vision is its cultural impact. What does this city do to the people and the world? Industrial society and its cities were built in the exploitative way, which is to take all you can get, to gain any advantage, to prevail, to possess exploitive approach of Jerusalem. And when you lose, the motivating force behind the exploitative way is fundamentally self or tribe center to win and control. We need an alternative way, ethical way. The ethical way is to do things right, to do no harm, keep the rule, play fair, solve the problem, add the value. Ethical approach pursuit win win whenever they can. The motivating force behind the extra way is to be good and do good, which can often also be self or tribe center. Ideal direction is a redemptive way. Redemption is an economic term that means to buy back something to restore it to its rightful place. Wherever there is loss, brokenness, unfairness, injustice, waste, or harm, and someone willingly enters into the situation by wearing a cost or taking a list to help the person, resource, or system to be restored or repaired. That's a redemptive action. Major contributors to climate change and unsociability are the developed country of the West. So their resource and skills should be widely served in the development process in developing country. Lastly, understanding the vulnerability of current urbanization process and the developing world, I suggest three key factors and nine goals to shape better future city. Leadership competence, integrated technology from a system point of view, and supervisory agency should be strengthened under the three core factor, nine goals, such as competent governance system, fiscal transparency and efficient collaboration with the university, industry, and city government, knowledge creation system, etc. For example, leadership competence. City mayor and city officials are responsible for the safety and well being of billions of citizens. In addition, they manage the large budget which come from tax paid by their citizens, and they deal with the impact of global warming problem. The leader should look to the future, leading global change, planning their cities development effectively, and driving timely change as their cities grow. Regarding supervisory agency, Cities should be required to have independent advisory groups separate from current city leader and government. Mayors, towns, and office are typically four or five years. For this reason, they are unable to execute long term vision to avoid the structural weakness. The city government mentoring group for city should be organized to create long term vision and plan spatial and territorial development projects based on this 
vision. I'm going to finish my presentation by introducing German Lucerne Penenberg talks about casual pride of the future. He portrayed the future as antecedent of the present. In this way, we see the present as an effect of the future in contrast to the conventional assumption that past and present are the casual of the future. A whole new century is coming. Cities can have powerful transformative impact upon the possibility of humanity and present opportunity for us countering climate change and environmental destruction. So we need to remember the hope, not only for the human future, but also for the transformation and renewal of our creature. Second, hope for both person and community, including the whole of humanity. Discernment and strategic choice for making good city are needed more than ever before. The bright future cannot be built through an individual city or its extent invention. Only through solidarity both within each city and with city at the global level in multiple dimensions, we can create new future city. I believe APLU can be one of the key roles for this action. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you for all the presenters and uh, I'll invite all the presenters to turn on your video. Thank you. And we can uh, have a, a discussion. Um, I think our, our panel kind of across is uh, from the theory in the, the framing when um, my chapter kind of introducing the concepts you know, discussing a more of a theoretical framework. And then we have uh, Seraph's uh, paper more on the methodology, how to assess vulnerability. And we have uh, Dr. Powell's paper on more policy level of uh, flooding, integrated flooding management. And Dr. Young's paper really get into understanding the place, the vulnerability, and the, the more you know, specific uh, infrastructure innovations we can make for our uh, cities and community to be more resilient. And uh, we have uh, Hedron Chair to look back again as a big picture, you know, what we can uh, plan and design for the future city and even uh, into a more kind of, kind of epistemic kind of understanding what's the value of the ethical way to build our city. I think uh, this is a, a really uh, a wide uh, range of, of topics and issues. Um, I think my first question is for uh, each of your study, what do you think how we can, so, you know, I'm thinking both what we can generalize from our research and how, you know, from your own research, uh, can you generalize any uh, concepts or theories or practices you think uh, it can be applicable to other places and that also relate to transferability? You know, whether you think uh, your contribution is, uh, you think it's transferable to other regions of the Pacific and other countries, or you think there are other, um, other factors we should consider uh, in terms of how we make our cities and communities more resilient and how to address uh, equity issue. Um, so, John, would you like to start? Yes, I think I should start. Well, I think for the methodology or for the model that we have used, 
in our study, the model using puzzle logic and PCA can only be as strong as the kind of data that we have or the kind of evidences that the previous study have already uh, shown. So I think it will start from meeting halfway from the data from the national government with regards to assessing vulnerability or disaster risk assessment of the communities and how we can uh, figure out how uh, we can see the intersectionality of the sector of the population. As you have mentioned, Dr. Cheng, in your introduction, the, uh, the kind of scalability and place specificity, it is the meeting of a uh, meeting halfway from the national to the local level, the kind of data that we use. I think that's for our study on how we can improve it or how other countries or other communities can apply it. Also, Aside from considering those, as I have shown, the, the, those are macro uh, economic uh, data that we, that we use. But I think with your introduction as well, Dr. Cheng, with the use of social memory and indigenous knowledge, I think it should be integrated more for uh, measuring or identifying, or should we say quantifying vulnerability. So we can indicate the degree, uh, the degree of uh, vulnerability of this community. It will be better if other data can be uh, inputted or encoded, such as sense of place, social memory, or indigenous knowledge. I think that's for uh, our study, for the part of our study. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, since you're talking about community level, I'll ask Dr. Yao to also um, share your thoughts. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> uh, my, my thought on, on the presentation I made was that uh, I'm very curious, uh, the, since, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, the floodgate is something that's, that's common in Taiwan nowadays for people to install in front of their house in case uh, there's a uh, flooding. However, <clears throat> we, we did notice that uh, floodgates, uh, the installations of the floodgate itself has become in, uh, issues that very difficult for people who's vulnerable, either be handicapped or be seniors living in the home alone. Uh, as Taiwan has become in an age society, a lot of seniors live alone at home and it will be very difficult for them to install the floodgates, even though they may have it right next to them. But uh, some of the floodgates could be pretty heavy. As you see on my slides that some of them were pretty high, I mean, the floodgate could be up to two meters in, in, in some extreme cases. So it will be not easy to install this floodgate becomes a major issue in Taiwan. I think in, in the next couple of years, it will be something that people will keep talking about it. I, I was wondering from, from the colleagues on, on these meetings that in your city, do you use floodgates also to, to help residential buildings from flooding or you have better other choices that we can learn from you. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if yeah. anyone can provide some suggestion for us. Thank you. Uh, maybe uh, Andrew J, you can maybe answer uh, uh, Dr. Yao's question and also, you know, maybe that can be part of integrated solutions you are presenting. Yes, uh, while uh, sort of exploring uh, the present situation of the city, uh, we mentioned also the integrated flood management is one of the options uh, many of the cities are opting, uh, already opted, maybe it's not very much successful as well. So we checked like uh, how the risk governance is play in place in that particular city. So what, what the major point came, like uh, there are various pressure and uh, to, to increase the vulnerability of the city. So it's not only the uh, unplanned uh, urbanization, also we need to see the, you know, the awareness of the uh, group who are actually taking decisions. There is a serious gap between the top down, uh, top group who are taking the decision making group and the community who are basically the, the, um, the main stakeholders and the uh, impacted people. So whether it's a vulnerable community or less vulnerable community within the city, so they are not getting uh, proper information. They are not being very much aware about the overall context of the uh, water management. So they don't have any idea actually what's going on. So the most of the decisions 
for the flood management and other things are taken care by uh, taken uh, from the top down method methods so i think that these particular things like if we have some sort of approach where we can also hear or listen from the community before taking the decision uh, or formulating any mega project at the city level that might be very much helpful or the people also getting awareness uh, so to this thing actually we came up uh, from the study uh, thank you mm -hmm. yeah thank you um actually john would you like to add on any other specific solution in philippines with blood? i think dr yes i think dr yao the philippines has focused more on their adaptation measures instead of the mitigation measures uh from the fact that uh, the local government or even the national government cannot provide uh, such resources for the community so it's the community who decides on it's actually empowering for the communities to decide on how they can mitigate flood on their own so and other private organizations or private entities have been helping them by providing technologies but with the kind of technology such as floodgate i think the philippines has has been uh, late for that i think uh, we are focusing more on or they have focused more on adaptation measures with regards to flooding for example mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um going to change a little bit the uh, scale to the future cities. Um, so Heijin, your, your framework is, I think it's particularly interesting on the redemption and, and that's very aligned with uh, the climate justice concept of you know, how we can you know, um, recognize that the past harm address systemic you know, injustice and uh, this actually also relates to uh, one of the audience question, you know, whether uh, the ethical way is feasible to be win-win situation and even in the cities as a complex systems. So do you have any, any thoughts on how we can implement that model and seek further? Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I don't have a clear answer yet. But uh, I'm still like uh, uh, thinking and wondering. Actually, this is the uh, issue of how we need to uh, discover the alternative value of good life and make it universe. That means how how like an urban professional can make a city for a good life and present to the people, and then how. how can we make the people to want to live that kind of life in a city without that uh, change? I think just a physical uh, environment or a city itself cannot uh, change anything. I think the way of life or the way of uh, people's habits or attitude that should be changed, I guess. Mm -hmm. So if we uh, you know, want to focus on kind of place-based uh, planning and, and how we envision a community, right? Can be moved um, into a more resilient future. Um, how can we reconcile, I, you know, because the, the the vision for the entire mega city is huge. Yes. Uh, and we also recognize, right, there is a place specific vulnerability and the uh, different community will have different voices, different visions. So how we can be making sure, you know, that we can all come into a common ground and everybody can benefit and all, you know, can, um, can, can, really achieve that uh, equity issue too. I don't know, anyone else can also uh, chime in, yeah. I think, I think Dr. Cheng, uh, with regards to similar to or in the context of the question, win-win situation in even in urban areas. I think that's a hard question because as long as elite or private individuals own the land in the city, 
there will be no win-win situation for the people. But to answer the question on how we can be more equal or how can we uh, eradicate inequality, I think we can start small at the street level in the urban area <laughs> if that will be, because that will be more practical and that is more doable. So uh, even protests or uh, movements or mobilization of the people start at the street level. So I think in the context of mega city or urban areas, how about we start uh, an, uh, integrating sets of place or uh, making it uh, more powerful for the people to think about the street, their street or uh, place making planning, for example. Mm -hmm. I think that's more doable. That's a hard question. <laughs> yeah, very, very good question. Any, any other thoughts before we conclude today? Yeah, Cheng, uh, like uh, after working with uh, like a couple of cities in the Southeast Asia, uh, what I realized, like uh, I fully agree with John, uh, like uh, ownership is missing. Like uh, I, I belong to the city, but I don't uh, think like this is my city. So uh, that's why like the waste disposal and all these things are, it's a government job, actually. This is not my job. So I do litter. So it's not my duty to keep it clean. So it's government job to keep it clean, right? Government is something which is alien. Somebody, some, someone will come and do all these things. So I don't have any responsibility on, on doing that. So that is also a, one of the major uh, component where uh, the, the political group or the decision makers are also losing interest. Uh, so, so maybe, uh, so I think it's a two-way approach should be the key. Uh, any side of approach like a protest uh, on the street uh, from the community who are affected, will not work because there are policy, there are a sort of fund uh, issues, there are land issues. Uh, so all these things are there, these are practical. So we cannot uh, sort of claim anything like this, which is not very much. That's why in the end, in our paper, we propose like the smart, which is sort of attainable or achievable. So maybe it should be realistic also. So anything we can demand. So demand, there is no, no end of the demand from the community. So, but what type of demand uh, might be uh, useful or possible for the administration to to follow or uh, in the context of the finance or funding is available so so i think all these things should be taken care of and and, and both sides of our mixed approach uh, top down and bottom up should be uh -huh. also maybe the key I, I mean i i don't think like nobody having a clear online answer for this mm -hmm. yeah is that it? there's no one size fits all answer here um, yes correct so both top down and bottom up, we all have to work together. So thank you. I think we are at the end of the hour today. So thank you all very much for the presenter and the participants today. Um, Dr. Kyle, do you want to close the session? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful presentations and discussions. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, joining us, everyone. Yeah, all the recording will be available soon, and then we will send you the recording whenever it's ready. Yeah, right. thank you so much. Thank you. Good. Bye. Bye-bye.